Thank you, Megan. First, I want to thank the citizens of Toronto and the surrounding areas for the tremendous patience, tolerance, anger, and despair that you have all shown. This recent past around the world and here in Toronto has clearly shown that the time is now over for incremental change. We as members of the Toronto Police Service are also grieving at the recent events, but we are hoping that as a community, we can all continue to work together. We will listen, we will continue through words and actions to help restore any public trust that is fractured, especially when it comes to anti-black racism. There have been recent discussions on the use of neck, knee to neck restraint techniques, and I want to be clear that this organization does not, and I repeat, does not train to this. Our members are trained to knee to neck belt line techniques. We are also trained to positional asphyxia and how to minimize loss of life in all situations. As to the discussions on funding, make no mistake that our budget is created with community. We are transparent in our spending. We are cognizant of our role in helping the city's goals of providing the necessary resources for every Toronto citizen. Since the Transformational Task Force and the Way Forward was created, a whole host of savings and cost avoidances have taken effect immediately while not compromising our service delivery. And we will continue to explore future opportunities and we will continue to work with community when it comes to the discussion on budget. I truly believe that this is the best, most vibrant urban city in the world. And I believe that our collective efforts are responsible for these outcomes. We still have a long way to go, but I know that because who we are, we will reach the finish line successfully. Our community will not stand for anything less. Thank you, Chief. Your first question is from Christina Tanaglia from CP24. Christina, go ahead. Hi, Chief. Um, so I guess I, I was frankly expecting you to speak ahead of this weekend as well. Uh, what I'm wondering is in regard to what we expect on Saturday in terms of peaceful protests in the city, if you could clarify what information do you have on groups or intelligence do you have on groups who have been known to in the past to visit a peaceful protest and cause a disturbance and loot? Some of these groups arrive from out of town with the intention of causing a disturbance. So what information and intelligence do you have on these specific groups and can you name them? Well, so here's the thing. I've heard this dialogue uh, throughout this whole event and every protest we've had to date has been peaceful. So I'm not going to speculate on what the intentions are. I can tell you that through my frontline officers, the vast mm -hmm. majority of people that have gone to the protests in the city of Toronto have been peaceful. There's a lot of passion there's a lot of anger, and there's a lot of hope. And I hope that as Torontonians, we continue to do that. And the other aspect that I've seen, a lot of the members that are at the protest have self-regulated those that were asked, that were showing up, and had a different agenda. We are hoping that that will continue. We do, as a law enforcement, have a lot of information, a lot of intelligence, which I'm not going to divulge to the public, but I'm going to urge that we continue to be Torontonians, and I'm going to urge that we continue to have the peaceful protest, and I urge that this is about making our city a better place. There's a lot that has been learned over the past weeks, and we want to use that as an example of moving forward with community. And we know the only way that we can resolve this is if we work collectively, not disruptively. Uh, Chief, thank you. Will you be attending any of this weekend's protests that are organized? And I'm wondering, will, is Toronto Police working with some of these peaceful groups and their organizers on a route? Uh, and in terms of the geography of the city as to w where these groups will travel? Well, as I stated, we have an understanding of, of what is going to happen. Uh, I've been involved in every protest that has taken place and I'll continue to do so. Thanks, Christina. Uh, now we have Ashley Lukaisek from News Talk 1010. Ashley, please go ahead. Hi, Chief. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, there has obviously been a huge conversation around uh, the black community and their relationship with police. 
And I'm just wondering, you said now is the time to stop incremental change. It has to be a big change coming in order to kind of rebuild trust uh, and things like that. So what, what are you as chief prepared to do to start repairing those relationships? We'll do what we'll continue to do. From, from the moment I, I took the seat, there are a whole host of things that we've done operationally by enhancing our training, not just through the technical and operational perspectives, but also understanding the lived experience of all of the members of the community, understanding how we add value, if we have better understanding, if we can work compassionately together. That defines the value piece for law enforcement in this city. You know, when we added our third day of training on community engagement and on de-escalation, one element that was critical and I made sure was there was the lived experience. Working with the PACER Advisory Committee, a host of a multitude of agencies, but more importantly, citizens, citizens of color, black members of the community, working with us, not only working with us collectively, looking at our procedures, looking at our regulations, looking at how we trained, and using a racialized lens to figure out how it can be improved. And I'll tell you, there are times when we had it wrong and they called us out on it and we made those changes. So it's not just by listening, it's also by action. It's about working with collectively in order to get this right. It's something that we as an organization have always done and always continue to do right from the moment we created the transformational task force. This is the only urban city that I can think of in North America that sat down half of the community and half of members of the Toronto Police Service from a blank canvas to say, what does Toronto want? What can we do to add value to make sure that we get it right? So we are always continuously learning of what we need to do. It's by active listening and it's by action and time and legitimacy are the other aspects that help us create stronger relationships. Thank you for that. Uh, and I, I wanted to know on a, on a personal note for you, um, being a black police officer, when you see things like what's happening in the United States right now, how does that make you feel? You know, I, I understand it. You know, anti-black racism, the, it, it, it's not words, it, it's a reality. When you look at North America's history, you have to lean into it, you have to own it. So when we talk about lynching, nobody talks about these subject matters. So. Take 1940, for example. 1940, a black man was hung because he did not address the officer by Mr. He said his first name. These types of atrocities have happened, and a lot of people tend to forget that. When they had public lynchings, they would be put in a newspaper. Tomorrow, 2 p.m., there will be a hanging, there will be a lynching. People would put on their Sunday's best to watch. So when you understand the history better, that this was not stuff that was done behind laneways. It was done in public settings. It was inviting. And we're talking recent history. You can figure out when you want to define recent versus past. If my mom and my dad were alive, then it's recent enough for me to say there was a problem. We have gotten better. But the incremental change is why people are so angry right now. There has to be bigger change. Community has to have a stronger footprint. We have to change our training processes collectively. And these are things that in the seat I have done. These are things that I will continue to do. This organization is far ahead from everybody else, but we're continuously learning. We are not naive to what's going on, but we want to work with communities to get even stronger and continue to be leaders when it comes to law enforcement. Next question is from Wendy Gillis at the Toronto Star. Wendy, please go ahead. Hi, Chief. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, I did want to ask you about the police budget. And while we're talking about incremental change, you know, some many critics would say that the changes that have been made as part of the transformational task force and recent changes to, to try to bring down the cost of policing are incremental and that they have not, in fact, had much of an impact on bringing down the police budget. It was below $1 billion for a couple of years. And, We've had it above one billion. So my question for you is, do you think that one billion dollars on policing is appropriate? And will we ever see a time when the police budget is not one billion dollars? Well, it was a long question, Wendy. I'm not sure where to begin with that. And first off, the Transpatial Task Force was a huge success. And it was a huge success because it spoke first about being community centric. So if you want to have a great debate between cost and value, 
we can take that to another forum because I will tell you, I'll go to value first before cost. We have to do what's necessary in order to keep our city safe. When we talk about anti-black racism, police, law enforcement, we deal with the symptom. We are not responsible for the disease, but we deal with the symptom day after day after day. So when I say that there needs to be change, we have to be brave enough, all entities. Why do we do over 30,000 calls for mental health? We are law enforcement. So it is a partnership to get this right, Wendy. And when we talk about our budget, when we talk about value, we play a strong role in that value piece. And you know, when we talk about Sir Robert Field, he says that, you know, uh, success isn't the measure of reduction of crime. It's the absence of police. That means crime is low. That means gun violence isn't where it's at. And the symptoms of why young men, especially of color, have a gun in their hand, we need to have those conversations. You've heard me talk about those lanes, at risk versus high risk. There is nothing in that high risk lane, absolutely nothing. So we need to be brave enough to really tackle it the right way. And I'll say members of the community have had a better understanding over the past couple of years of what the actual disease is, of what the actual problem is. And so if we listen a little harder and really be brave enough to deal with the problems, the day that there's a citizen in Toronto that does not get meals delivered to them because of their postal code is a good day. So if we're gonna talk about equality, Let's open up, lift up the rug, and let's have that discussion. Thank you for that. Can I take from that answer that you would be open at some point to having some money that currently goes towards the police budget go towards those kinds of uh, programming that, that deals with the symptoms and can actually prevent crimes that you are out there fighting? Wendy, I've spoke to this for years and you've written articles on this, so there's nothing that would suggest that I would change that. I have always championed for it. But are you willing to, to take a hit to the police budget? When we talk about the budget right now, Wendy, if you look at the numbers of the gun violence that's there, the numbers are high. When we talk about the symptoms, when we talk about mental health, the volumes every single year for the past 12 years, the Toronto Police Service has been the de facto anytime after four o'clock until six o'clock in the morning. The fact that when we talk about the gun violence and the number of handguns that are here and the number of guns that are being used, right now we've got a responsibility, we've got a role, and that role is to keep the community safe. Now we need other agencies to help offload those responsibilities of helping the at risk, of helping the high risk. Then we can start talking about the reduction. But until then, it would be naive to reduce police officers who right now, when you look at the numbers versus the calls, we're not near where we need to be as a community. And so it is a product that everybody has to be involved in. You can't just dump it in front of the law enforcement and say, here, deal with it. It has to be dealt with collectively. Thank you for that. Next question, Austin Delaney from CTV. Austin, please go ahead. Hi, Chief. I'm just wondering about the staffing levels on the weekend. Will it be a normal weekend or are you bringing in reinforcements in case things go to go awry? Well, as we have with every event, Austin, there is always a plan. I've got highly trained people. We do thousands of protests a year. Uh, this one, I assume, will be bigger and we have the resources to police what we need to police. Chief, as a follow up, a number of the businesses downtown are boarding up their windows in anticipation of trouble. Do you, uh, do you recommend that businesses do that? No, I'm, I'm not going to speculate on anything. I think a lot of people are trying to get me to predict what's going to happen. I can predict the past and I can tell you citizens of Toronto have been incredibly peaceful when people thought that that would not happen. So in light of the situation, in light of people are starting to listen to what the outcomes need to be for our community, people are coming down because they're protesting because they are upset and they want change. We as law enforcement want change, and we want to make sure that we get this right. And, and so that's what I'm going to speak to. If it switches, we have the resources necessary to deal with those situations. Thank you, Chief. Our next question is from Molly Hayes of the Globe and Mail. Molly, please go ahead. Thanks, Megan. Hi, Chief. Um, my question is around body cameras. Um, that's obviously you know, a big part of the discussion these days, and I guess I'm curious. How much um, is there still to nail down on that, um, you know, despite your commitment to, to roll it out within the coming months? 
um, you know, for example, the cost, what the policy will be in terms of whether they're constantly running versus um, discretionary filming. You know, how much is still in the up in the air on that? Well, we're near the finish line, and thank you for the question, Molly, because th that has been a discussion that I have had for years. I have wanted body-worn cameras. This adds to transparency between police and community, and having those body-worn cameras will help give an objective account of that situation in those moments, and it's critical. We're near the finish line. A lot of people think that it's easy to just put cameras on people. Uh, we have done it the right way. We have worked in partnership with the Ministry Attorney General's Office. We've worked in partnership with the OIPRD, with the Privacy Commissioner, with the SIU, and a host of other people. We have had community um, uh, town halls on the very discussion on, on what are the things that you would like put in play to make sure that we at all times respect privacy, but at the same time have the ability of of recording what's necessary. And so it gets tricky when we have certain things, for example, young offender, person under age, having that person's image shown, uh, people who have been victimized in a horrific way. What do we do with these things? So working in partnerships, we've got all of those things ironed out. Now we're down to the process piece, which is um, who will be awarded, whatever, and then we'll move forward. But I have been pushing hard. I want this done now. The people are talking. They want this. I want this. It will help with building the relationships that are necessary if we're going to keep the city safe. Thanks for that. I mean, there are some who would disagree that cameras are the solution, you know, particularly if officers do have the discretion to decide when they run. So what do you say to people who feel that this is maybe being um, rushed out right now when there still are so so many sensitivities around the technology and frankly it comes with such a, a hefty price tag. Yeah. So yeah, some, some agencies ran out with it. We did not. We did a, a one-year pilot. This is before I, I took this seat. And that one-year pilot reviewed everything with all of those lenses that I stated earlier to make sure that we've got it right. And the one thing that the Privacy Commissioner said was, we do not want the cameras on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because then it becomes surveillance. So we have to, when we live in such a democratic city, listen to that, work in order to get it right. And so there are so many factors. And if you, if you really look at the presentations we've made in the past, this organization was very thorough with it from start to finish, representing the respect that the community wanted for privacy, but also making sure that it was used as a tool for transparency and accountability, which is what the public is screaming for, and which is what we're, we're screaming for as well. Can you say how much it's going to cost? No. No, uh, we'll have a cost once we get it all put together, and, and uh, we don't have a cost of it yet. But again, we're talking about value versus cost. This is too valuable not to be considered. This is why we've been aggressively looking for and making sure that this is something that's added to this organization. From a value perspective, when you listen to the public, when you look at the petitions, this is something that people are demanding have happen. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Molly. We now have Faiza Amin from City. Faiza, please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, Chief. Um, there's afternoon. been contradicting posts online of uh, protests this weekend. Have police been able to narrow down who's organizing what? Are you expecting counter protests? And also, how big are you expecting this crowd to be exactly? Again, I'm, I'm not going to divulge operations, and, and I'll, I'll speak to what we said from the start that, you know, the protests of before, same thing, people were saying the same thing. But when we looked at what happened, the citizens of Toronto were respectful, they were there to make a statement. They wanted to make sure that we were heard loud and clear. We have heard loud and clear, and we really want to get this right, and we want to move forward. But to give up operations and what we know and what we're going to do uh, would be foolish for me to do. And what do you think is the, the root or the center of what many are say is a broken relationship between police and the black community? What do you think that root problem is pertaining to police specifically? I, I, I spoke to it earlier. Um, I, I gave it a bit of a detailed account of, of anti-black racism. I spoke to uh, trust and accountability, transparency, all of these factors. But these are things that we want too. These are things that we are looking for too, which is why uh, when I spoke about the Transformational Task Force and how we started, uh, it was from a blank canvas working with community of all shades and, and all aspects to make sure that we got it right. So that it was a cornerstone developed by community and law enforcement. I spoke with the Pacer Advisory Group and the 
tremendous work that they have done. We are all striving to get it right. It is evergreen. So as public uh, shifts in, in what they think is valuable for communities, especially with the relationship with law enforcement, our, our, our objective as law enforcement is to do that, have the adaptability of moving in real time to satisfy the community's needs. Thanks, Faiza. Oh, sorry, Faiza, did you have a follow-up? No, just wanted to say thank you. Okay. Uh, Chief, we're just going back to Christina Tanaglia, who has a follow-up. Christina, go ahead. Um, Chief, I understand. Uh, thank you, Chief, and thank you, Megan. You don't want to give up, you know, operational information, but from a logistics perspective, people in the city who are watching want to know what's happening or what potentially could happen in their neighborhoods this weekend. Can you divulge the information you have even about the geography about this, the size of this, uh, where exactly the, you know, the center of this gathering will take place? Yeah, but Christina, I, I'm, I'm not being coy, but I can't control what I don't own. Uh, these are protests that are held by members of the public. And so for me to start saying, here's what's going to happen, I can tell you what my men and women are going to do, but, but short of that, I can't do anything else. But I can tell you historically, the things that have happened in this city are, are, have been peaceful. And a lot of times the protesters have uh, self-regulated and worked with us. And, and, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I, I'm certainly not going to speculate because I do not have control. Can I ask you one more question, if I may? Um, I'm curious because, you know, criticism and hostility by some people, some groups toward the police, uh, you know, across North America is not new. And we're seeing a lot of that in the last week across North America. I'm wondering, Chief, if some of the criticism you've been hearing, is it fair or frankly, are you offended? No, some of it is very, <laughs> is, is more than fair. Listen, the, the, there isn't any law enforcement officer that I can think of that, that, that did not have a horrible feeling in their stomach when they saw what happened to George Floyd. It still bothers me. I mean, I have kids and, you know, I'm running the, the organization as chief. That is not what law enforcement is trained to do. Uh, we're there to preserve life. We're there to enhance uh, community safety. And when you see that, I mean, it, they'll have their day in court, but I, I will tell you, I, I was, I was, I was offended by it. And that is not representative of the vast majority of law enforcement members in the city of Toronto or in North America, nor should it ever be tolerated. So the fact that it was videoed, it speaks to value again, why we need the body worn cameras, why we need to work with communities if we're gonna get this right. And anything that we do to divide and our actions have to be appropriate to, to show inclusion, to show that we're listening at all costs if we're gonna get this right. I think that this city has done a great job. I think this organization has done a great job. I can lay out the transcripts of things that we have done to support our community relationships because it's the right thing to do and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Our last question today is from uh, Wendy Gillis at The Star. Wendy, please go ahead again. Oh, thank you, Chief. I just wondered if you could uh, potentially comment on comments being made by uh, potentially a former Toronto police officer, Robert Lykop, who has been saying that George Floyd deserved to die. Yeah, and th listen, those comments are just horrible. And, and, and the, the one thing that's most important, uh, that person is not a member of the Toronto Police Service, does not represent the values of what we are about. Uh, I've stated over and over and over again, we have to work collectively if we're going to get this right. That type of narrative is, is, is completely inappropriate and it is not acceptable. And that person does not work with the Toronto Police Service. I believe that they're in uniform. That person is not a member of the Toronto Police Service. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, Chief, that's all the questions we have for today. Thank you.